All right, here we go with Fetal Echo 24, 24, lecture number seven. These four chapters are all related to the aorta, basically. The first one we're going to talk about is aortic stenosis and bicuspid aortic valve. So aortic stenosis is a stenosis of the aortic valve, and it's usually at the valve, but it can be just above or just below. But stenosis is a narrowing. Now the valves, um, the valve um, has leaflets and typically it is a tricuspid uh, valve with three cusps. And with this aortic stenosis, the valves can be dysplastic, meaning not grown correctly. And they can be bicuspid, they can be unicuspid, or they can be non-commissural, meaning it doesn't have any of those lines between the leaflets. There may just be a kind of a solid membrane with a hole in the middle. That's a non-commissural dysplastic aortic valve. So if the aortic valve is stenotic, usually the four-chamber view is normal. The five-chamber view, which is the left ventricular outflow tract longitudinally, uh, may have post-stenotic dilatation. So whenever something goes through a narrow area, if you have a, the aortic outflow tract leaving the ventricle, and then it has to force its way through a narrow orifice, the velocity increases in that narrow orifice and shoots out beyond the aorta. So there is a jet just beyond the valve that is high velocity. Prior to the valve, you had all the blood moving together, uh, the edges moving pretty fast, and the middle blood moving the fastest. And that's called laminar flow, where you have everything kind of moving in the same direction, um, often at different speeds. The edges being a little slower, the middle being the fastest. Now, when you go through this narrow area, what happens is it shoots out there and gets very turbulent on the other side. So you have this very narrow jet that basically goes into the ascending aorta, which starts off just normal diameter. But if you have this little tiny jet in the middle shooting at head, it disturbs the whole laminar flow that you had going. So now you have turbulence. So laminar flow, normal. Turbulence, abnormal. Laminar flow, not much pressure pushing out on the sides of the vessel. Turbulent flow, lots of pressure pushing outside on the vessel. And that's why you get this dilatation. And the dilatation is after the narrowing. Now, on ultrasound, um, not only can you see post-stenotic dilatation as seen in these pictures, um, you can see the thickened valve leaflets. Normally, in systole, the valve leaflets open up and they get plastered against the wall of the ascending aorta or aortic root. That little area right beyond the valve is called the aortic root. So the valves kind of whip open like saloon doors and they are right up against the wall so you can't see them during systole. But if you have dysplastic valves, they may be thickened and they may not move very well so you can actually see them in systole. Now, the other place you could potentially see this, it's pretty hard, but uh, in the RVOT short axis of the right ventricle, that circle that you see is the aortic root. So normally a short axis view of the right ventricle, looking at the RVOT, shows you the pulmonary artery, the ductus arteriosus, and the right pulmonary artery. And the thing that they kind of wrap around is the aortic root right at the level of the aortic valve. So you may see thickened leaflets, you may see bicuspid aortic valve. Now using color for diagnosis, the main thing is turbulence. 
The direction still is forward, but once it gets beyond the valve, there is turbulence, and that's what color is good for. Spectral Doppler is good at velocities and measuring them. Color Doppler is very good at determining, well, direction, but also turbulence. So if you use the Spectral Doppler and you get it on, um, get your gate onto the uh, aortic valve, and you try to get as close to zero as possible because you're looking for a peak velocity. And just like in a middle cerebral artery when you're looking for anemia, you'd like to have a zero degree angle and not use any angle correction. That gives you your best estimate of the peak velocity. And that's what we're looking for here. So what you'll see is you'll see a high velocity. You will see a slow acceleration. How do you tell that? Well, in the picture at right, you can kind of see that these peak velocity uh, waveforms that you see there have a little curve on each side. They don't go straight up. They kind of curve up a little bit. The reason for that is the ventricle is pushing everything through a very small hole, and it just takes a little while to get through there. Also, if you drop a line from the peak down to the bottom, you can see that it's fairly well in the middle of that waveform. Normally, it's at the very front of that waveform because normally the ventricle contracts and all the blood just goes out right away. Um, here's another view using a 3D view. Um, the term en face is you know, French for, well, it means facing forward. So unlike the 2D grayscale things where you're taking cross sections. Here you're kind of looking at it from a little farther away, uh, and that is a surface rendering. But you can see that is the uh, aortic root in cross section. Now, aortic stenosis can progress during the pregnancy. Uh, it can progress quite far to what they call critical aortic stenosis. That means the leaflets now are so dysplastic, the commissures, you know, the space between the leaflets, sometimes um, starts to close off and the orifice of this valve becomes even smaller. And it either becomes smaller or it just never gets bigger, like it's supposed to with a developing baby. And over time, this, this very critical aortic stenosis, leads to left ventricular dysfunction. For a while, this nice healthy ventricle just pushes it through that little orifice and the velocity goes up. But eventually, that ventricle starts to fail. It gets a cardiomyopathy from having to push through there. And this left, dis left ventricular dysfunction is what really defines critical aortic stenosis. So in other words, if you have uh, aortic stenosis, that means the velocity goes up. Maybe so there's some dilatation after the valve. Uh, with moderate and severe, the velocity goes up even higher. But if you have critical aortic stenosis, that means that the left ventricle now is being affected adversely. And the extreme form of that is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. All right. I'm going to just throw this in here because it's in the book. Um, I don't think it's important, partly because I'd never heard of it before. Um, but there's something where uh, you can have aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis with normal left ventricular function. That's called the Schoen complex. I'm not really sure where that comes up, but just keep that in mind. The Schoen complex is narrowed in the in valve and the out valve also. All right, what are some of these associations with aortic stenosis? Um, well, 20% um, of these aortic stenosis um, babies will have something else, some other congenital heart disease. And coarctation is probably top of the list. Um, so, Unfortunately uh, for you uh, and these babies, um, very few of these congenital heart disease diagnoses are isolated. They frequently come in groups. Um, 
And when they ask you what it's associated with, what other structural abnormality, um, and if you have to guess, because you don't know it off the top of your head, guess something that's nearby or just guess ventricular septal defect. So, for example, aortic stenosis and aortic coarctation frequently happen together. So a narrowed valve and a narrowed aortic um, arch frequently go together. So here we go with some that are just nearby each other. The other thing is coarctation and a left superior vena cava. That coarctation, you know, happening up in, in your left shoulder, that's where the left superior vena cava is happening also. Another association with uh, aortic stenosis is congenital heart block. And the way that occurs is um, sometimes if you have antibodies that attack the conduction system, like SSA, uh, well, not only does it attack the conduction system, but we also know that it attacks, attacks the myocardium. It also uh, attacks the nearby aortic valve, too. All right. Here's some uh, example of conditions associated with the presence of a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, and very much, it's really kind of a subset of aortic stenosis where the valve has two cusps. But you can see basically the point of this slide is that um, you've got aortic problems and superior vena cavas. Um, the whole idea is that something nearby uh, is associated with it or a VSD, and in this case, it's both. All right, so this bicuspid aortic valve, um, supposedly it is the most common congenital heart disease and has an incidence in the general population of 2%. Well, that doesn't make any sense because we said that the incidence of congenital heart disease is 1%. Well, it's very often because bicuspid aortic valve is not included in these fetal series. Typically, um, it's not, uh, well, actually, it's very frequently not diagnosed at all, so it's not included in these fetal series. So um, the chance of fetal heart, uh, fetal congenital heart disease uh, being picked up is about 1%. Um, but the bicuspid aortic valves are typically not included there. But just keep in mind that of all these things, bicuspid aortic valve is among the most common. Um, it has a pretty strong inheritance pattern. It's if a parent has it, I'm, it can be um, passed on in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning there's a 50% chance of passing it on. Um, and as we said before, um, aortic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve, 50 to 70% of the inherited ones have coarctation. So if you have bicuspid aortic valve, but neither one of your parents had it, um, we don't consider that inherited. Um, but if one of your parents did have it, and then you have it, you have a 50 to 70% chance of having coarctation with it. Now, Bicuspid aortic valve, they say there are many variations. Here are two of them. I can't think of a million more, um, but uh, maybe they are. Um, but basically, whenever you have this bicuspid aortic valve, you have two leaflets instead of three. And really, they're sort of variations on the original three cusp valve. So if you got like the Mercedes symbol, um, and one of the commissures is either um, rudimentary, meaning it's, there's only a little bit of it left over, and they call that a raphe, see down below, R-A-P-H-E. That thing is kind of a remnant of that commissure that should have been there. And then you can have it where there's no raphe at all. It's just two um, cusps. And typically, one is about twice the size of the other. Now, bicuspid aortic valve, like I said, is just a subset of aortic stenosis, um, and it can have a very wide range of clinical outcomes, from critical aortic stenosis resulting in a small ventricle in the fetus, all the way 
it can range up to an adult with a bicuspid valve who never has any symptoms at all. Now, when it comes to aortic stenosis, if you've made that diagnosis, and the reason you suspect it, it you can see in the chart over on the right, is post-stenotic dilatation of the aorta or, and or a thickened aortic valve. And in general, the next thing you want to do is grade it. If you think there's a narrow aortic valve, grade it. So mild aortic stenosis is more than 100 centimeters per second, but less than 200. So if it's 50, well, that's not even stenotic. If it's 150, that's mild. Moderate and severe are greater than 200 centimeters per second. And the thing that differentiates severe from moderate is when the aortic or mitral valves start failing, they start to have regurgitation. Then you've moved into severe. So the main thing is 200 centimeters per second. And if you start getting failure of the aortic or mitral valve, then it's severe. All right, let's move on to the next chapter, which is really kind of a, a move along the spectrum. We started with aortic stenosis, which is a narrowing of the aorta, and now we've moved into critical aortic stenosis and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Hypoplastic, undergrown, left heart. Um, and typically the way it occurs is because of left ventricular left ventricular outflow obstruction. For a ventricle to grow, it needs to have inflow into the ventricle and outflow. There needs to be a volume of blood going in and out of the ventricle. And if it doesn't happen because it can't get in, or if it doesn't happen because it can't get out, it never grows. All right. Now, critical aortic stenosis, um, again, these things overlap, hypoplastic left heart and critical aortic stenosis. A hypoplastic left heart is really a small, non-functioning ventricle. Critical aortic stenosis is kind of in between regular old aortic stenosis and hypoplastic left, meaning there is narrowing, the ventricle's still working, um, but not very well. So, this severe stenosis typically first results in a dilated ventricle. And when I say dilated, I don't mean the whole thing needs to be massive. It just needs to be, instead of kind of V-shaped, it becomes rounded. Because it's pushing against this tiny little opening to try to get all the blood out. So you get this dilated left ventricle, and then you get this echogenic inner wall, and that's called endocardial fibroelastosis. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, and then over time, poor contractility. So we're talking about a left ventricle that's failing. And failing means less contractility, because that's what it's supposed to do. So a failing heart is one that doesn't contract. All right. Now there's something called the mitral valve dysplastic syndrome. And remember we said you need a volume of blood going in and out of the ventricle for it to grow. And in this case, it wasn't the aortic valve that was the problem. In this case, it's the mitral valve that was the problem. It's dysplastic, probably stenotic, um, and the ventricle typically doesn't grow, but in this, re in this case, it's because of poor inflow. Now, when you have mitral valve dysplastic syndrome, the primary problem was a bad mitral valve. You have a thick dysplastic valve. Interestingly, the papillary muscles attach directly to the leaflets. So normally, the papillary muscles are really just muscle sticking out from the wall of the ventricle. Then there's these little strings called chordae tendini, which go from the papillary muscles to the leaflets. 
They keep the leaflets from blowing back the wrong direction. But in this case, this mitral valve is dysplastic, so the leaflets are thick, the papillary muscles are big and long, and all jammed up against each other, and there are no cordy tendony. There's no little strings. It's just papillary muscle right to a leaflet. And when you get those papillary muscles all lined up next to each other, that is called an arcade mitral valve. From an architectural standpoint, an arcade is a whole series of arches. So here's a couple arcades. And that's what these uh, papillary muscles look like when you, you know, open up the ventricle afterwards. And an adult heart, you can see it on an echo pretty well, um, where you have all these papillary muscles jammed together. All right. So mitral valve dysplastic syndrome, critical aortic stenosis, and hypoplastic left heart syndrome are essentially the same. They both have poor flow in or poor flow out, resulting in a final problem of the ventricle doesn't grow. And the worst part of the spectrum is the hypoplastic left heart where the ventricle is very small and completely non-functioning. So here we are, we're gonna look at some hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients. And the left ventricle can be dilated. Now look at the picture on the right, the ultrasound picture. Um, the left ventricle is smaller than the right, but it is dilated. You can see that the septum is bulging into the right ventricle. Because early on in this pregnancy, the ventricle was trying to jam it through that narrow aortic valve and just couldn't get it through. So it got bulging into the right ventricle. The next thing is echogenic. You can see that the wall of the right ventricle, that lateral wall, you can barely see it. But the walls of the ventricle, they jump out at you. They're very bright. And then it can be small. And in this picture, basically, you can see that you can be dilated, echogenic, and small all at the same time. Um, that arrow that is in both pictures is basically telling you that the right ventricle is forming the apex of the heart, not the left. Normally, it's the left that's the further one down toward the apex. All right, here we go with a few more pictures. I think it's always useful to look at lots of pictures um, to give you practice, because when you see it on the test, it's not gonna be the same picture that we looked at, but if you've looked at 10 different ones, you'll be able to pick it up better. So here we've got this dilated left ventricle, it's bulging septum, and the lumen, instead of V-shaped, is more round. The picture on the right just shows a different variations of the how a ventricle can look. All right, well, typically hypoplastic left heart syndrome progresses. In fact, you can have a normal four-chamber view in the beginning of pregnancy and end up with hypoplastic left heart. Um, but the way that it happens is first there is a narrow valve. And that very frequently is missed because um, we don't typically do peak velocities on aortas early on. But the first thing that happens is you've got this narrow dysplastic aortic valve. The next thing that shows up after a little time of this high velocity stuff going on and turbulence is post-stenotic dilatation. That probably should be picked up on the LVOT view, the five chamber view at that point. The next thing that happens is the ventricles pushing really hard through this stenotic area. The part beyond the valve gets dilated and the part before the valve, which is the ventricle, really has to work hard and the pressure is very high that high pressure starts to make the septum bulge toward the right side. 
The next thing that happens is endocardial fibroelastosis, and I'll talk about that in one minute. And then further down the line, the ventricle becomes less kinetic. Its fractional shortening decreases, and it is failing. And then finally, the left ventricle just stops growing. And which of these things in the progression is when you see it? Um, early on, you're going to be probably toward the uh, beginning of this progression, and later on in the third trimester, you'll probably be at the later part of that. All right, let's take a moment to talk about endocardial fibroelastosis because it's really not talked about in the book. But what it is, is, you know, the coronary arteries supply the muscle of the heart, and you can see the arteries on the outside of the heart. Uh, so they come from the outside in. And by the time, you know, they get to the inner third of the muscle, you know, they're very small, um, tiny little vessels. Well, when the left ventricular pressure gets high, it starts to interfere with that blood flow in the very smallest vessels in the inner third, the subendocardial third. Now, if the pressure is so hard pushing on this area, you kind of get, it kind of gets like a bed sore, which, you know, which is where it gets ischemic, lack of blood flow. So the inner third of the muscle can die. And when it dies, it can heal by scarring or fibrosis. Typically, the main significance of endocardial fibroelastosis signals the fact that the left ventricle is no longer useful and repair will probably have to be univentricular. In general, the surgeons would always you know, like to fix things and use two pumps, the right and left ventricle. But if the left ventricle is non-functional, they're gonna spend their time trying to hook up all the plumbing to the ventricle that does work. That's a univentricular repair. So once you see that bright ring, you can kind of tell that ventricle is shot and you can start talking about a univentricular repair. All right, well, different manifestations of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, you can have an absent left ventricle. It is so tiny that you can't even see it. Um, you can have a small left ventricle or you can have a pretty easily identified um, ventricle, which is dilated and echogenic. Here's, uh, and then on the right, you can see a couple where the uh, septum is bulging um, toward the right side. Not only the ventricular septum, but the atrial septum can start to bulge over too, because if the left atrium has no place to go, um, it tries to go back through the foramen ovale. Um, and that's actually kind of hard to do because remember the foramen ovale flap kind of closes shut and doesn't allow it to go back. It will go back, but um, it's, there's some resistance there and it, so it ends up just pushing the whole septum that direction. The other thing that you'll see, uh, particularly with, you can see on the one on the right with endocardial fibroelastosis, you can see that the fractional shortening's almost nothing. Um, and if you look at the one on the left, at first glance, it kind of looks like everything's just fine. But what you can see is, if you look at the right ventricle, there is a difference between systole and diastole. But on the left ventricle, both lines move together. So there really is no difference between systole and diastole. So that one's a tricky one. So. Look at that one carefully if you see it on the test. Um, look and see what the cursor is through. You can say, oh, right ventricle, oh, and a very echogenic left ventricle. I bet that's not going to contract. And then you go down there and you see that systole and diastole are basically the same. All right, here's some more endocardial fibroelastosis pictures. Here we go with no left ventricle. Uh, in fact, when you put on the color, you only see inflow to one side of the heart. The other side is so tiny. Again, more pictures. 
We've got an absent left ventricle, small left ventricle, no flow, small left ventricle, minimal flow. All right, with hypoplastic left heart, you can, will see left to right shunting. So just remember, whenever it comes to shunting, blood moves from high pressure to normal pressure or high pressure to low pressure. But generally you have one side that's normal and the other one's high and blood moves that direction. Now, if the left atrium has nowhere to pump the blood because the left ventricular pressure is so high, what it does is it goes back across the foramen ovale. So you can see the colored picture on the right is blood shooting back across from the left atrium back to the right atrium. Now, in general, the two places that we're talk where a change in shunt direction is discussed are the foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus. And so those are the two fetal shunts, and they can change direction. A shunt really is a shortcut between two structures, uh, and uh, you can see shunt direction changes with pathology. So here we've got high left ventricular pressure, which results in high left atrial pressure, and now that sends blood back through the shunt. Remember, the way the foramen of LA normally works is blood comes back from the IVC and shoots right across the foramen of LA. That oxygenated blood shoots right across the foramen of LA into the left atrium. That's the way it's supposed to go. But now with this pathology, the left atrium contracts and just pushes it right back to the right atrium where it came from. The, remember, there's two places that there are shunts that can turn around and go the wrong way, and it's the foramen ovale and here, the ductus arteriosus. So normally, there's antegrade flow in both the aortic arch and the ductal arch. Everybody knows that. But if you have left ventricular outflow obstruction, the pressure on the other side of the valve uh, is low. Inside the ventricle, it's super high and causes elastosis. But on the other side, it starts to be low. Not much is getting through. So what happens is if you have low pressure now in the transverse aortic arch and normal pressure in the pulmonary artery, the blood just shoots right around the ductus arteriosus and goes back through the, the aorta that direction. And what it ends up doing is it goes back and fills up the coronary arteries because remember the coronary arteries arise from the aortic root. And if there's not much or nothing coming through the valve, well then the coronary arteries will never get anything. But this ductus arteriosus shunt reversal allows blood to go retrograde back to the coronary arteries and perfuse them. All right, what's another thing you might see? Well, A wave reversal in the pulmonary veins. Well, up until now, we've talked about A wave, um, mostly in the uh, systemic venous circulation. So we talk about them in the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, blood returning back to the right atrium. But blood comes back to the left atrium also, and those are the pulmonary veins that do that. So they have a very similar waveform to the inferior and superior vena cava, not the same, similar. They're similar in that they are triphasic. The difference between pulmonary veins and IVC is in pulmonary veins, it's all antegrade. You have an S, you have a D, and you have an atrial notch, but it doesn't go below the baseline. It doesn't go backwards. Um, but if you have super high pressure in the left atrium because it can't jam it into the left ventricle, now when the atrium squeezes, instead of it all shooting into the left ventricle, it shoots back through the foramen ovale and it also pushes back on the pulmonary veins. So now that atrial notch becomes more than notch, it actually turns into retrograde atrial wave. 
All right, VCAX, V-C-A-C. That's a ventriculo or ventricular coronary arterial communication. Early on, when the ventricle is still working, the pressure is so high, well, one, it causes fibroelastosis, two, it causes a bulging septum, and three, it opens these little channels right through the wall, and blood goes from the actual ventricle into the coronary arteries. So that's the ventricular coronary connection they're talking about. Ventricle blood to coronary artery blood. So mitral valve dysplastic syndrome is pretty similar to aortic, critical aortic stenosis and hypoplastic left heart. But in this situation, it's the mitral valve that's dysplastic initially, not a later development. So for that reason, mitral valve regurg starts very early, leading to a dilated left atrium. So that's the big difference between the critical aortic stenosis slash hypoplastic left heart and the mitral valve dysplastic syndrome is the dilated atrium. And it's dilated because this mitral valve has been slipping the whole time. All right. And the difference between hypoplastic left heart and critical aortic stenosis? Well, they both have bad left ventricles, but in hypoplastic left heart, it doesn't work at, anymore at all. All right, here's the summary of the findings. Small hypokinetic left ventricle, frame and flat bulges towards the right atrium. You can get a hypoplastic or non-visible uh, transverse aortic arch. Usually you can still see it, but it can be harder to see because it's so small. If you do see it, you can actually pick up reversed flow coming back by way of the ductus arteriosus. You can see a left to right shunt across the foramen ovale. Normally it's supposed to be right to left. And when you put on color, sometimes you will only see color going into the right ventricle. The treatment for this is something done after birth. There is no uh, accepted uh, treatment for this um, beforehand. So if you have a hypoplastic left heart the procedure is called the Norwood procedure after William Norwood, who actually spent a lot of time at DuPont Children's Hospital in his end of his career. But he came up with this three-step operation. Um, that's The first part's done in the newborn period, and then two others later on. Let's talk coarctation of the aorta. So coarctation of the aorta is a narrowing of the aortic arch. We typically talk about things that are narrowed and things that are basically non-existent. Coarctation is a narrowing. And usually the place that it's going to be narrowed is between the left subclavian artery and the ductus arteriosus. That is the isthmus. So you've got your aortic arch which has branch number one, branch number two, and branch number three is the left subclavian artery. And then right after that is the ductus arteriosus joining up. And that little narrowing there is called the isthmus. And the isthmus, just like the isthmus of Panama, um, is the narrow area, narrow area. So unfortunately, or fortunately, the narrowing in coarctation of the aorta typically occurs at the narrowing. Ugh, that'll make things tough. All right. Well, when it comes to picking up coarctation of the aorta, what's the number one sign? The number one sign is ventricular disproportion in the four chamber view. And I don't know if this is the real reason, but the way I remember it is we kept saying that a ventricle grows based on inflow and outflow. And if you don't have any of those, it never grows. Well, if you have a coarctation and the amount of blood flowing out through the aorta is decreased, 
perhaps that's the reason the left ventricle is a little bit smaller. So disproportion in the four chamber view. Normally, the right ventricle is already a little wider than the left ventricle. Again, another thing to make it a little tricky. Um, but normally it's about 1.2. Another way of saying that is the right ventricle is 20% wider than the left ventricle under normal circumstances. But with coarctation, it's about 1.7. So another way of saying that is the right ventricle is 70% bigger, wider than the left ventricle, or three quarters larger than the left ventricle. Now with coarctation of the aorta, the valves work, the ventricle works, and the velocities are normal. That makes it different than hypoplastic left heart syndrome. How about some other differences between coarctation and hypoplastic left heart syndrome? With coarctation, the left ventricle still forms the apex of the heart. Remember back in the hypoplastic left heart, it was the right ventricle that was uh, comprising the apex of the heart. But with coarctation, even though that ventricle is a little narrower, it's still just as long. So it's not getting shorter, it's just a little narrower. All right, what other structural things tend to go along with it? Well, the one that goes along with coarctation is left superior vena cava. So put your right hand on your left shoulder and just think that's where the coarctation is occurring and that's where the left superior vena cava is. Here's a picture um, showing superior, uh, a left superior vena cava, a diagnosis you're all very familiar with. You can see that little um, part between the atrium and ventricle just kind of scooting around there. All right, so when it comes to coarctation, it is suspected in the four-chamber view because of the disproportion, but it is confirmed in the three-vessel three trachea view. Here's some pictures of that. And what you've got is you've got a narrow transverse aortic arch and a normal pulmonary artery. Now, there's two types you can have. One is the traditional narrow isthmus. So the isthmus is that place right before the ductus hooks up. And that's the traditional one. But you can have more than that. It can be a little more extensive than that isthmus. It can actually involve the whole aortic arch sometimes. And that is called tubular aortic hypoplasia. It is open, um, but it's more than just the isthmus. All right, so the isthmus. Well, what's narrow? Well, when it comes to measuring the isthmus, we know that it's slightly narrowed anyway. That's called, it's called the isthmus. Um, but there are z-scores for the diameter of the isthmus. And there are z-scores for the aortic arch. And remember, to review a z-score, uh, a z-score is really kind of a measure of standard deviation. And the whole point of them is they're supposed to take into account gestational age. So you don't have to remember what number um, is too big or small. You just need to know the z-score. So typically, if something is too small, it will have a negative number z-score. So if it's less than minus two, that is abnormally small. If it's greater than two, it's abnormally large. So in this case, you're gonna have a negative z-score for the isthmus and transverse aortic arch. All right, well, we know that measurements, you know, quantitative things, we actually have numbers are very helpful. So these z-scores are very important. Um, how about some qualitative things, some yes or no things? Well, one of them is tortuosity. Now, remember this picture of a hockey stick and a candy cane. 
Over on the left, you've got the normal, which is this um, slow curve of the RVOT ductal arch. And you have this tight curve of the candy cane, which is also a little bit higher. And that's the normal thing. But you can see, if you look at the back of that candy cane, it's nice and smooth all the way down. However, with coarctation, you, you lose that. You have this little kink in the back there. And that little kink is called a shelf. Now, it's a pretty dramatic name for a pretty subtle finding. Um, but that's what it's called. That little um, kink in the candy cane is called a shelf. And that sometimes will be the thing that jumps out at you. Again, we use lots of things to try to pick these things up. One of them is the disproportion of the ventricles. Sometimes the only time you'll pick it up is in this one. Your aortic arch shows a shelf. And here's some pictures. Uh, the one in the middle shows that shelf, which is a little kink. Um, the one over on the left is normal. So it's a nice, smooth candy cane. Right after the um, left subclavian artery, you can see it's slightly narrowed, but there's no kink. But in the second picture, there's a kink, and that's called a shelf. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that there is a gap between the second and third branches. So the first branch is the brachiocephalic artery. The second one is the left common carotid artery. And then the third one is the left subclavian artery. But if you have a gap between those, think coarctation of the aorta. Now, sometimes that late arising vessel looks like an aberrant right subclavian artery. Remember, sometimes if you have an aberrant right subclavian artery, the branches are right common carotid is the first one. The second one is the left common carotid. Then the third is the left subclavian artery. And then you've got this little extra thing way down the candy cane called the aberrant right subclavian artery. With coarctation, you have an elongated distal arch, but still just the three branches. Aberrant right subclavian has four vessels, so count them. If you see one that's way down the candy cane, count the vessels, and if there's four, you think, oh, that's an aberrant right subclavian. And if it is coarctation, you'll have the normal three vessels and a big gap between branches two and three. All right, well, here's a little digression here. Um, when this whole echo thing, echoes in general, I think, um, my personal goals for me and hopefully for the department is, one is to improve detection of total anomalous pulmonary venous return and two, improve detection of coarctation of the aorta. And the reason I think that's important is that they are usually missed. Both of those are usually missed. Actually, they're hardly ever picked up. And they're usually disastrous. Um, either the, the newborn dies or there's pure hell that the family has to go through before it's finally figured out. But the point is, it's a big deal. And... Keep in mind, if someone comes for a detailed and we don't find it, it's not going to be found. So that's kind of the important take-home thing here. So in addition to getting you ready for the boards, the real things I really want you to go from being okay at to being really good at are finding these two particular things. All right, so first step, we suspect it. We see RV, LV disproportion. Okay. Then we go up to three vessel trachea and we say there's a narrow transverse arch. All right. Now we go to the aortic arch view and we see a shelf. So we're thinking, okay, I think we may have some coarctation here. Um, so we wonder, is this coarctation or is this normal? Um, so what do we do? We frequently send them to pediatric cardiology and they give us an answer. And their answer, was it just a hunch or a feeling? Like, how'd they figure it out? How come they figure it out and we just kind of sent it to them? Well, 
our suspicion started with a hunch and theirs started with our referral. But in either case, what happens next for both them and us, and hopefully us a little bit more going forward, is once we have our hunch, then we do a systematic evaluation. And that's kind of the whole thing with echoes in general, which is you see some stuff wrong, but then you just go back and objectively go through your systematic evaluation and figure it out at the end. You don't figure out things, you don't figure out the diagnosis during the echo, you figure them out afterwards. All right, so what is the systematic evaluation? Do some quantitative measurements, the z-scores of the transverse arch, the z-score of the isthmus, and then qualitative findings, yes or no. All right, so we've got our aortic arch, we've got our isthmus, and then we've actually got a number for the RV-LV ratio. And keep in mind that for coarctation, it's about 1.7. After we've done some quantitative things, then we do qualitative. Is there a shelf, yes or no? Is the distal arch elongated? Is there a big gap between the left common carotid and the left subclavian, yes or no? And that's how we figure it out and give our best guess. All right, let's just practice. Practice again, seeing lots of different pictures of the same entity are very helpful. Um, so that when you see it on the test, it doesn't take you off guard. You've seen 50 different variations already. And these are the kind of things that probably you should um, just look at on your own over and over again. But all of these, you see that there is a disproportion in the pulmonary, or a PA diameter and the uh, transverse aortic arch diameter. Um, let's see. Here we've got a uh, number of shelves, which... Um, the aortic arch and the ductus arch, there's a little, you know, shelf there. Here we go. Here's another one. Uh, the more and more you look at it, you see it's not a smooth candy cane. It's just a little tortuous. Here we go again. Got a little discontinuity there. You've got your isthmus, and then right after the isthmus is the shelf. And again. All right, so here's the summary. And in this case, it all started off with just seeing ventricular disproportion. And then from there, you go on and figure out which thing that you're looking at. All right, we're going to finish up here with a few slides on interrupted aortic arch. All right. So the aortic arch typically can be interrupted uh, in three different places. Um, and so there are th three different types. And the one that is the most common is the middle one. So um, it can be after the first, after the second branch, or after the third branch. And the most common one is after the second branch. They usually have a big malalignment VSD. Of course it is. Can anything just be all by itself? Nope, they always seem to come in groups. And here we go with this VSD associated with it. And here we go, we've got a malalignment uh, VSD. So that's the thing that you see in the, four, uh, the five chamber view. And then when you go up to the three vessel trachea view, you have a very hard time getting that arrowhead that we're looking for. The arrowhead meaning the pulmonary and the transverse aortic arch converge on the descending aorta, but you just can't get it. All you get is this kind of spotty thing there. Um, that's the, the tip off. The other thing is that the trachea is right next to the pulmonary artery. That kind of tips you off. Oh, it's just not. It's not just a matter of me not getting the transverse aortic um, view in the in this slice. Um, it's the fact that there is no transverse aortic arch. 
that's what allows the trachea to get so close to the pulmonary artery. All right, well, big surprise. There's a frequent association with 22Q deletion to George syndrome, feldocardiofacial syndrome. And because of that, there may be a small thymus and you can see that the pulmonary artery basically is in contact with the anterior chest wall. Another clue is you just can't seem to get the aortic arch. So the one on the left is normal. You've got the aortic arch, outstanding. But then over on the other one, you can't seem to get it. In fact, the aorta seems to just go right straight to the baby's head there. Well, that's the tip off that you've got an interrupted aortic arch. Same way in the three vessel, you can't seem to get a normal three vessel trachea. It looks, yeah, there's a transverse aortic arch that's not working. All right, let's talk about neonatal treatment. Well, clearly, um, if you, um, what needs to happen is the ductus arteriosus needs to stay open uh, because if it doesn't, you can see from this picture that the left subclavian's not getting any blood and the whole bottom half of the body, the descending aorta, is not getting any blood. So you need to keep this ductus arteriosus open until you can fix it, which is basically right away. So let's take a little time to talk about prostaglandins. There's different types of prostaglandins. The one that's used for this is prostacyclin. It's a type of prostaglandin that um, basically will has a, an effect by keeping the ductus open. So they are given after birth to a baby who has a ductal dependent lesion. A ductal dependent lesion means um, if that ductus closes, the baby's in deep trouble. So they need to keep the ductus open until they can fix it. So they start this prostaglandin infusion. As an aside, the one thing you already kind of knew is that the opposite is indomethacin. Indomethacin is a prostaglandin inhibitor that you use to inhibit the prostaglandins of inflammation in your joints and so forth. Well, Indomethacin closes the ductus arteriosus, and that's not a great thing. So if it's used for um, preterm labor and it starts to close the ductus arteriosus, that's bad for a fetus. On the other hand, if the baby's already born and you give it to a newborn uh, to close the ductus arteriosus, that's a good thing. Because in some babies, they have a patent ductus arteriosus, meaning it didn't close when it was supposed to. So they give the baby indomethacin to make it close. And then here's your final summary, and that's it for today, folks.